Spencer. I'm the Dean of Humanities here at Montgomery College. And on behalf of the college, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to our Tacoma Park Silver Spring campus. This morning, our keynote speaker is David Bellows, who's going to talk to us about translation and the meaning of everything. <laughs> Dr. Bellows is an accomplished translator and professor of French and Italian and comparative literature at Princeton University. Before joining the Princeton faculty, he earned his doctorate in French literature from Oxford University and taught French at the universities of Edinburgh, Southampton, and Manchester. He is the director of Princeton's program in translation and intercultural communication and is the author of the best-selling title, Is That a Fish in Your Ear? He has translated many authors from French, including Georges Perec, Life in Beauty's Manual, Ramon, Ramon, Gary, Ismael, Kadare, and Paul Fournel. His biographies include Georges Perec, A Life in Words, which was awarded the Prix Goncourt at the La Bibliothéographie, and um, he has also translated Romain Gary, A Tall Story, or that is his biography. For those of you who are concerned, and I think many are, about the impact of machine translation, I refer you to Dr. Bellos. I helped it in the New York Times a few years ago. I translated. Please join me in welcoming Dave Bellos to Montgomery College and to the second annual Confluence Conference. Dr. Bellos. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, to celebrate um, International Translators Day, which fell, falls, falls on the Feast of St. Jerome, which was yesterday, September the 30th. And uh, you may have noticed um, the huge national silence that surrounded this <laughs> international <laughs> festival. Um, now, <clears throat> um, I'm not here to tell you how to translate. I know many of you are professionals, and um, I wouldn't even think of uh, uh, telling you uh, such a thing. It's also very boring to talk about how to translate, or how best to translate, or you know, the right way of translating. Um, what I want to talk about is something more general, but I think much more interesting, and which frames all subsequent questions about how to do the thing. Uh, I want to talk about what translation means, what the phenomenon of translation means, what it means about human societies, and what it tells us about ourselves. Um, because I think the way you understand translation, what translation is, ought to be the basis of how you understand what language is and how you relate to these bigger problems. I'm wearing a microphone, but I still can't be heard. I'm sorry. Uh, can you switch me on? So I have to wear another microphone. Okay. Yes. I've got a microphone. Uh, one there. Uh, let's see. Uh, I need to go up here. Okay. And am I on? I'm on. Do you have an echo? No? All right. Okay. I carry on. I have an echo. Um, now, what is translation? Translation is one of the ways in which we cope with the fact of linguistic diversity. But we must stop and think about that, because um, the fact that people speak different languages isn't itself a reason for having translators and translation. Because let's say there were only five or six languages spoken around the planet. Well, we'd learn them uh, if it was necessary, if it really enhanced our lives. Everybody is capable of learning five or six languages. But that is not the situation. The situation, as you know, is that there are not dozens, I mean, not hundreds, there are thousands of languages. In fact, the, the current official total on ethnologue.com is 7,160. And this creates a really interesting mathematical problem. Um, because obviously you can only ever know a tiny, tiny proportion of the languages spoken on this planet. 
and however polyglot you are, and even if you're a teacher of translation or whatever, you still rely on translation for the vast majority of the possible um, directions of language flow. Now, between any two languages, yeah, there are two directions of translation, yeah, A to B and B to A. Between three languages, there are not three directions of translation, there are six. Now, yeah, try it out. If you've got French, German, Chinese, you've got French, German, French, Chinese, Chinese to German, Chinese to French, and German to Chinese and German to French. If you have four languages, the total number of translation directions jumps to... Sixteen. No, twelve. twelve. <laughs> yeah. Five, it jumps to... Twenty. Yeah, the formula is... It's, once you get the hang of it, it's dead easy, yeah? It's, it's uh, n times n minus one, yeah? So it's between five languages, five times four, you know, 100 languages, 100 times 99. Uh, between the uh, 23 languages, official languages of the European Union until 2015, yeah, it was 506, 23 times 22. But then Croatia joined last year with a new language, BCS, Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian, and it jumps from 506. Anybody do mental arithmetic? Go straight to 552. Uh, and um, so, uh, in theory, if you had translators translating simply uh, professionally from one language to another in one direction, uh, at any meeting of any committee of the, Uni of the European Union, you would, in theory, need 552 other people present to cope with all possible directions of translation in the room. And clearly, this doesn't happen because there isn't a single room in the Berlaymont building big enough. Um, so, um, in the world as a whole, with over 7,000 uh, distinct forms of speech that are registered, if you were to have um, a, a, a direct translation between these languages, how many directions would that make? Seven. Seven, it's just a snit in short of 49 million. And if you staffed each direction with a couple of lexicographers, because you need term bases, uh, with enough translators to be on tap 24-7 and a few proofreaders and correctors, you would have, uh, well, approximately the population of South America all involved in nothing but servicing translation industry. Now, that is not the case. That doesn't happen. There aren't any continents, even uh, countries, even cities, even skyscrapers within cities devoted solely to translating. So how does it happen? Uh, we don't use translation in such a simple-minded way as to say, well, everything goes from A to B by professionals who do A to B. Um, because if that were the case, well, it, it's not possible. Yeah. So how do things actually happen? How does translation actually take its place in our world? I'll tell you a story from the late 13th century. <coughs> Marco Polo got back from his amazing travels to, um, along the Silk Road to the court of Kublai Khan. And when he got back, he told such fantastical and ridiculous stories that he was flung into prison in Genoa, in the north of Italy. Um, Perchance, serendipitously, uh, he was put in the same cell as an old friend of his uh, 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 from Pisa, Rusticello da Pisa, his name was. And uh, Marco uh, Polo narrated his stories to Rusticello in their common dialect, which was the Pisan dialect of Italian, um, of medieval Italian. And Rusticello wrote it all down. But he did not write it down in the language in which it was spoken. He wrote it down in French, a particular version of French. Why? Because French was a language of, at that time of not so much of greater prestige, though it was of greater prestige, but of greater circulation. Uh, at that time, French was the language of Cyprus and the Kingdom of Jerusalem, and they, they were spoken by traders and merchants all around the Mediterranean um, and um, um, parts of the Middle East, as well as France. So it was a more useful language because it could have a bigger audience. And so he didn't translate it. He, just, he as it were, wrote it down in a written, in a language for writing from what he heard in another language. Um, the stories that he told uh, were pretty extraordinary. 
and uh, as soon as the manuscript in old French of Divisament du Monde uh, came out, it was circulated, it was copied many times, um, and everybody wanted to know what was in it because it was really about r really new stuff. Um, so what happened? Well, the obvious thing to do at that time <coughs> was to translate it into Latin because Latin was a language known by everybody who could write since anybody who could write had been taught to write in Latin pretty much throughout Europe. Um, and it's from Latin that it could then be translated back down again quite quickly into Icelandic, Gaelic, Czech, uh, all sorts of languages that had no translators working from Italian or from French. Yeah? Um, so that you get this uh, uh, very obvious a relay structure from one language to a more general language to a super general language and from there it can go in all sorts of directions that it could not have gone. Yeah, those, those don't exist as directions of translation. Okay. Um, you know, in this sense French was a pivot language or a relay language in the first place. Latin was the super pivot. Um, <coughs> Um, and they are uncommonly useful things. It's the way the United Nations and the European Union Interpreting Service works. They work on relay. Uh, they go from one language into a more general language and then taken back down again. Um, and when you use Google Translate to get a letter from a friend who's writing to you in Swedish into the Hebrew you'd like to use to share it with a friend in Israel, you can be absolutely sure that the software does it exactly like Marco Polo. Right? There is no algorithm for translating Swedish into Hebrew or other things that Google Translate appears to offer you, like Yiddish to Vietnamese. I mean, it's a wonderful idea if you could, but there isn't an algorithm for translating Yiddish to Vietnamese. Although Google is very cagey about how its system actually works, we know it, it works through relay, through pivot um, uh, translation. And in the majority of cases, though not actually in all cases, the pivot that Google uses will be the same as the pivot that is used widely in the world today, and that is English. Yep. Because of the way Google works, it, it has to use those languages for which there is uh, the most material on the web to give it its probability and statistical reckonings, and uh, that's why. Okay. Um, alongside English in the world today, there are some of the languages that do serve as real pivots. Um, French, notably, it still is a pivot language. Uh, German, uh, quite surprisingly, until the demise of the Soviet Union, Russian was, of course, a major pivot language for all the languages of Eastern Europe and, uh, and also the Far East. Um, but English is the dominant one now, and it seems to be ever more dominant. And part of that dominant, well, that dominance is not really created by English speakers. It's created by second language speakers of English who want to use English as their pivot. We don't need a pivot. We already speak the pivot. Um, so, uh, and one little example of this that I quote in my book and that I'll just mention again is the project by the Confucius Institute in Beijing to produce um, a, a work of great cultural importance to them. It's called The Five Classics, though in fact it's not actually five books, but um, uh, from of ancient Chinese philosophy in the major languages of the world to make Chinese philosophy accessible. Um, and there's an international team of very scholarly people from all over the world collaborating on this. But the decision was made right at the start that the first translation they would do would be into English and the English would be used as the calibration, as the, not quite the pivot, but as the calibration of all the others so that uh, that's how the Chinese hope to produce um, their uh, classic philosophical texts, actually in nine world languages, that say exactly the same thing. Yeah? Because they will be calibrated against the English translation as the measure of stability. Um, so that's what pivot languages do. That's what they've always been used to do. There's no point grumbling about it, because without it, with the numbers I've given you, it would be totally impossible ever to actually have a circulation of ideas, texts, and objects of uh, that kind throughout the world. Uh, there's no reason to regard relay translation as a blot or an exception, as it sometimes is, and 
you'll find academics turning their noses up books that have been translated via other languages, but there's really no justification for that at all. <coughs> but that sort of pyramid shape of languages means, for me anyway, and I shall try and persuade you, that there really are two rather divergent, rather different things involved in translation, or are there two different kinds of translation? There's translation towards a pivot language or a potential pivot language, let's say towards a language of greater circulation and which may itself then be used for subsequent translation into languages which, to which you have no direct access. And there's translation from a pivot language, taking it from a language of wider circulation, wider readership, to a more specific audience, a more limited um, uh, uh, cultural linguistic zone, which is unlikely ever to be used as a text for retranslation or transmission into third languages. Okay? Um, I think they are rather different operations. And I've given them in my book uh, with its silly title, I, I call them translation up and translation down. Very hierarchical. I, I make no apology for that because I think it is a hierarchy. It, it is about social hierarchies um, um, and practical hierarchies. Now, for um, readers of English and of French, and possibly of German, it's difficult to see the difference because currently all translation into English is conceptually, intentionally, uh, translation up. Uh, so we're blind to it, um, in a way. <clears throat> That's to say, our expectation of a translation is that it will fit pretty seamlessly into our contemporary conventions of how such books are written. Um, you know, a detective novel translating English will sound like a detective novel, etc. Um, um, and I mean, this is true whether we're dealing with technical reports, social sciences, uh, or literary novels. Um, our conventions are that it will if it's to come into English, then it's to come into English properly, um, uh, like it was an English book, English language book. But <coughs> in languages that currently serve predominantly as receivers of translations, of translations down, the conventional expectations are often quite the opposite. That's to say that a foreign work will bring something new, something different, will enrich uh, and increase the range of the target language rather than fit into what's already there. I, for, I mean, as you can, I'm sure, imagine, some of you might uh, know directly, that readers of Arabic are not going to disparage a translation from English because it uses words not previously encountered in Arabic. That's the whole point, is to bring into Arabic terms for things for which Arabic uh, um, is currently deficient. As you think of it the other way around, few readers of the best-selling English translations of Scandinavian crime fiction are going to praise the translator if parts of it are thoroughly obscure because they use words of Swedish um, for things that are particular to Sweden. They don't. Um, okay, so the, 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 the difference is really quite stark between these two directions. Uh, and the reason is obvious. Arabic speakers are, broadly speaking, looking to learn something new from outside. English language readers haven't the slightest interest in learning what Swedish police officers are called. Maybe they should have, but they haven't. And they're not provided with that information when they're reading the Millennium Trilogy. Okay? So that's why I sort of make my rather grand, oversimple point that translation is not just one thing. Yeah? It depends who you're doing it for, into what language, and how that fits into the uh, the big scheme of things. Um, and the big distinction I make is between up and down. But there are others that can be made beyond that, but that's the big structure of, of difference. Now, over you know, recorded history, many different languages have served as pivots or as key pivots. And among them, well, as you know, we have to count Sanskrit, um, uh, a, a Tibetan, which was the pivot between Sanskrit and Chinese. Uh, Chinese itself has served as a pivot for the transmission of Buddhism to Japan. Uh, ancient Greek served as a pivot for all sorts of texts going this way and that in the ancient world. Syriac uh, 
uh, was the transmission medium from ancient Greek to Arabic and from Arabic uh, to Western Europe. Uh, obviously, Arabic itself has served as a major pivot for Greek philosophy and mathematics reaching the West. Uh, Latin, of course, served as a pivot for a thousand years between all the languages of the West uh, and French. Um, but today, uh, it's English uh, that dominates. French, as I said, remains uh, uh, um, uh, uh, a le an important but much lesser pivot, and German a bit too. Um, so Spanish does not play that role, and nor does Portuguese. Uh, it, they haven't acquired that status of languages you translate into for further onward translation. They are still, for reasons that are not clear to me, because they have very similar imperial past, these other languages, uh, they've not acquired that uh, central role. Um, I think that the, the, the size and scope of the global role of English nowadays, however, has no direct historical precedent. I don't think there was anything ever you know, in the Latin-speaking, Chinese-speaking, Greek-speaking world, there was anything quite as um, marked as the hierarchy and dominance of English today. So I think it behooves us to be not blinded to uh, a reality of the very particular role that our language plays, no doubt temporarily, because all empires come to an end one day, and has played only for a short time. Uh, English was not a pivot language a hundred years ago, not, 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 not significantly. It is post-Second World War. I mean, even, even in between the First and Second World War, the pivot language was French. Um, uh, as you can see from the foundation of the League of Nations and its success, uh, English has only very slowly been allowed in. I mean, your, your postage stamps, airmail, it still says par avion, right? because when the Universal Postal Union was founded, it was obvious it had to be in French, because that's what everybody understood. So it really is really quite recent. It's, um, uh, uh, and it, it's happened at an incredibly uh, fast pace. <coughs> and it is not based on um, economic power or conquest. That's perfectly clear because it's not imposed. It comes from the rest of the world. It, it's they who are choosing to make English their pivot rather than the other way around. Um, but it is quite difficult I mean, to do that. You need a big jump of the imagination. I mean, speakers of pivot languages have almost always deluded themselves into believing that because they possess a dominant form of speech, they have better access to the truth. Yeah, it's very difficult not to believe that what it means is what it says in English. <laughs> because we, we can look back in history and see that happening. That's what the Greeks believed. Yeah? The Greeks believed if it wasn't said in Greek, yeah, well, it couldn't be very interesting then, could it? Um, and that's why they call people who didn't speak Greek um, Varvaros, they, they made, just made a noise, va, 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 yeah? Var, var. that's our word barbarian, comes from that. It means people who don't speak like us and therefore have nothing to say. Um, okay, uh, Arabic intellectuals in the early modern period also claimed that only in Arabic is thought, uh, can you really think. French grammarians of the 17th century wrote, extremely elegant um, but utterly specious uh, raisonnement as to why French was the language which most closely approximated the form of thought itself. Um, okay, uh, and I'm sure in many other languages uh, uh, at different points in history uh, people have come up with the same obvious but ac actually delusional idea that the language you speak is closer to the truth than languages you don't speak, uh, basically, which is all the argument really comes down to, and you invent a grammar to prove it. Um, uh, okay, so into these, these, these kinds of languages, pivot language, intermediary language, also called vehicular language, have a kind of endemic tendency to promote themselves or to delude their own speakers that they are this thing called interlingua, yeah? the uh, mythical code of pure meaning um, you know, that stands above um, uh, any actual linguistic expression that they are close to pure meaning. Uh, the thing that uh, computer scientists were chasing after in the first decades of the development of machine translation until they at last realized that it was indeed a delusion and a red herring and that interlingua doesn't exist. Um, it took that failure for somebody then to come up with Google Translate which is a quite, quite different kind of operation. Okay. Within this broad field, as I've described it, battle has raged for centuries um, about the best way to translate. And uh, 
the most familiar uh, way of describing the battle lines um, is in terms of literal and free. Yeah? Um, more recently, uh, in English academia, it's been recast as a battle between domesticating and foreignizing. That is to say, uh, uh, foreignizing translations are ones that retain some uh, textual signals of the uh, uh, of the original, of its original culture and linguistic form. Domesticating ones are ones that, that, that tame it, that, that rub out uh, all perceptible or legible signs of foreign origin. Um, there are other ways of talking about it. And in French, they used to talk about the focus on the source and the focus on the target for these two dimensions. Um, or in a more floppy way, in an older kind of English, to talk about te uh, translations that serve the reader and translations that serve the author. Uh, uh, it's, it's the same argument. It's just slightly different way of formulating the same tension um, in any translation. Because any translation <coughs> may be more or less close to the formal properties of its source in terms of sentence length, sentence division. You, know, you can respect the same sentence divisions or not. Uh, word order, uh, just as it may uh, highlight or else hide the cultural specificity uh, of the original. That's so you know, can keep the Swedish word for policeman uh, or not, or turn him into a chief detective inspector for London or whatever. Um, uh, so obviously these are things, these are variables and you can choose to do more of one and more of the other uh, as you go along. But I think that your a translator's decisions you know, on this seesaw between um, uh, superficial fidelity to formal properties um, and adaptation, I don't think that's got anything to do with the best way to translate. I think what determines that, uh, whether consciously or not, but what always determines it is where you are situating yourself on this polarity of translating up and translating down. It's really to do with a hierarchical relationship or what you conceive of as the correct hierarchical relationship between the, not just the source and target text, but between the source and target language and the culture that they uh, uh, bring with them. In my view, this polarity has always been the dominant factor in translators' choices. But of course it shifts over time because these, ex these big external sociological factors change. And as I said, as with English, they change sometimes quite quickly within a generation. Um, but they also are variable according to domain, according to a specific professional domain. For example, in English, the prestige of German philosophy, of the German tradition of philosophy, has been very high for 200 years. And English language translations of uh, classic and contemporary German philosophy, I mean Kant and Hegel, uh, uh, conventionally, traditionally, use words of German and use sentence structures and forms of language that mimic the, the uh, grammar of German as well, and that is felt to be proper, because actually when you are translating Kant and Hegel from German to English, you are translating down, not up. Uh, so it's, it's limited to that particular domain. Uh, a contrary example that will seem to you more plausible is that in the post-war years, in 1945 to 50, the French discovered American crime fiction, and it was really exciting. And loads and loads of translations of American crime fiction were launched as paper once again became available after the war. Um, and uh, a very snooty literary publisher, Gallimard, founded its own crime fiction branch under a different name. Um, and in those early translations of American crime fiction, Americanisms were all over the place. English words, terms, phrase, even got to the point where Gallimard asked its um, hack writers to adopt English pseudonyms because it made it more, sound more authentic. Yeah? And there you can see this a um, uh, foreignizing translation style. And indeed, there are many pseudo-translations in that series. The book's actually written in French that say traduit de l'américain. And that you, there's a social cultural moment where it's smart to sound American in French. Um, uh, and so that's how you do it. You foreignize, you don't domesticate, because it would be a great disappointment if uh, uh, um, American cops sounded just like Maigret, because you've got Maigret already, you know, who needs another one? Um, uh, 
uh, at the present time, um, the uh, well, global prestige of social sciences in the United States is very high, and um, uh, uh, foreign works of social science translated into English, um, well, their foreign authors would be extremely disappointed if their translators didn't make them sound just like American social science. They want that, that's the, the world to which they aspire to integrate. Um, so you translate that way around. You don't make Piketty sound too French. You make him sound as though he was an American economist. Um, okay. Nevertheless, some contemporary translators of uh, into English uh, see themselves as um, messengers bringing the good news that other languages are different. Um, and they make a great song and dance about allowing Dostoevsky to sound Russian, about allowing Kafka to sound German, and to allow Proust to sound French, um, and to do this by translating him in these authors in ways that bring into English something of the difference, roughness, strangeness of these foreign languages. Um, <coughs> Uh, and at the most extreme, there are efforts in translation to make the translations as difficult, indeed almost as incomprehensible, in the target language as they were in the source. And my favorite example of that, because it's, it's not a silly example, is the translation of the Hebrew Bible into German by uh, 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 Martin Buber and uh, Franz Rosenzweig in the 1920s. Um, uh, they wanted to translate the Bible in a way that would remind German Jews that their holy text came from a world quite unlike theirs. They wanted to, as it were, mark the strangeness and distance of the Hebrew Torah in German. And so it's full of Hebraisms, it's written out in lines that look very bizarre. Um, uh, uh, um, it uses old forms of German words and a lot of Hebrew words in German transliteration. And it's really difficult to understand, <laughs> even when you speak German. And that was the point, you know, to, to make it a difficult text again. Yeah. OK, so it's a, it's a serious, um, uh, pro it maybe a self-defeating project, but it was a serious project uh, with some intellectual background to it. Um, however, the thing that makes us skeptical about all these retranslations of Dostoevsky and Kafka, and even the Buber Rosenzweig Torah, is this that um, for them to have any effect, the reader of the translation has to recognize what sounds German, or what sounds French, or what sounds Hebrew. In other words, there has to be some existing convention in the receiving culture of what those languages are. So you get the paradoxical thing that you can only foreignize a translation when that particular foreign is not actually foreign. Yeah? And my, uh, my sort of counter-argument is, well, yeah, if I wanted to reproduce Yoruba sentence structure in English, I suppose I could, but nobody would know, because nobody knows Yoruba and not clue, and they would just think it's a lousy translation. Um, and so you, you can't actually achieve the aim of foreignizing. Um, it's a, in my mind, quite self-defeating and rather pointless thing, and it it's the elegant version of what Hollywood has always done for Nazi officers in World War II war movies. Yeah? Uh, Nazi officers all speak perfect English, but with an accent. Yeah? Uh, and it's like a conventional symbol. We know this is German. This says nasty man. Yeah? So it's, 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 um, it's very, to my mind, it, even the most sophisticated versions of this argument are close to a license for pastiche and I don't take that seriously. Anyway, but it's true that, you know, whichever way you translate, whoever you are, you, uh, all translators are struggling with uh, uh, to negotiate a settlement between two fundamentally incompatible things that some people call L1 and L2, and others call S and T, I mean, original and translation, or the languages of the original and the translation. They're incompatible because the words of L1 do not match the words of L2. Uh, there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, any word in a language and any word in another language. For example, simple, silly example, um, uh, we have one word for 
for this thing, chair. Yeah? Uh, French has two words, uh, uh, chaise and fauteuil. Uh, one of them is a chair with arms, and the other is a chair without arms. Uh, so if you're going to be really pig-headed about it, you could say you cannot translate the word chair into French, because you have to say more than the lexical entry chair contains. Yeah? You add something. And similarly, you can't ever really, well, you can translate either chaise or fauteuil into English, but only in an unnatural way by having a footnote or an expansion. Um, uh, he sat on an armless chair. Um, he, he sat on an armchair. You know, uh, so you, you can do the supplementation, but you can't do the taking away. Um, uh, OK. Um, I think it's absolutely trivial, but other uh, people make a great mountain out of this, not even a molehill. You'll, Walter Benjamin has a whole page on it. You know. um, it's a molehill because um, making matches between words um, is just not even a serious problem when compared with the profound differences between the grammatical structures of different languages. Um, uh, I mean, I, I think the differences between very closely related languages like English and French are actually quite profound as well. But I will use an exotic example to, um, and also a very conventional one that others have used before me, because it's such a good example, uh, is the idea of whether or not it is even possible to translate from American native language like Hopi into English. Um, uh, Benjamin Lee Wharf um, made rather famous the uh, uh, fact that uh, Hopi, among a number of other languages around the world, it's not unique in this respect, um, doesn't mark the things we think are important, like definiteness or indefiniteness. It doesn't have a the or an er, uh, and it doesn't mark gender, um, and it doesn't mark case. What it has is its structuring thing, in a sense, and this is what's called an evidential. Uh, that nouns ha have to uh, uh, be marked for their status as to whether they are visible to the speaker at the time of speaking, um, have been seen by the speaker at the time of speaking but are not actually present, or have only been talked about. So there are three evidential statuses of uh, physically present, physically attested, and only orally attested. And uh, these are the endings on the noun things in Hopi, but also in there, there, there are bits of it in Bulgarian, and apparently Chinese has something like this as well, uh, evidential status. So uh, 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 Benjamin Wolf made the point that um, the sentence, the farmer killed the duck, cannot be translated into Hopi. Because you have to know to translate it into Hopi whether it's this farmer that one out there, or whether it's a farmer I've just been told about, whether the duck is here, or outside the wigwam, or a mythical duck or a legendary duck, because without that knowledge, you can't, haven't even got a shape of a sentence. Uh, it's like trying to speak English without tenses. Um, you can just, but it's pretty incoherent. Um, um, uh, conversely, you can't really translate a Hopi sentence into normal English, because you're not accustomed to saying, the farmer I can see um, uh, killed the duck you told me about, um, uh, or words to that effect. It becomes a very peculiar, periphrastic, long drawn out thing. And so the, uh, this example case, well, it's almost a legend now, grammatical chestnut, is taken to mean that actually at bottom, you know. <coughs> what you see in the world is shaped by the language you speak and is incommunicable and that these are different worlds and that they never actually, they may overlap a bit, but they never match so that you can't ever really translate yeah, between these systems that are, uh, they don't just have different words for things, but they have a different, uh, profoundly different underlying structures and say different things about them through their structures called anisomorphism, anisomorphism of natural language. Um, it's, uh, to my mind, it's not nearly as much of a problem as it might seem when laid out like that. 
because after all, the sentence, the farmer killed the duck, is only untranslatable in this sense when it's in a grammar book or in a philosophical argument. Because language outside of these is always used in a situation, in an utterance, in an actual occurrence. And in an actual occurrence where you say the farmer killed the duck, you know very well which farmer it is and which duck it is. Otherwise, you wouldn't be saying it. And you would know which endings to put on your uh, uh, expressions in Hopi. And vice versa, if you were interpreting for a Hopi speaker, you would know why those endings were there, and you would either disregard them as not needing to be marked in English, or you would expand them if they were relevant to the force of that utterance in situation. That's true in speech. It's also true in an extended text, in a novel. Um, you know, uh, uh, the problem with many of these arguments about translating a language is that they they conduct themselves through decontextualized little fragments of speech, which are of no interest to anybody, because language, that's not what, like, in use, language does not, as it were, first arise in the grammar book. It arises in situation, in interaction. Um, and I think that the um, supposed obstacles of non-matching vocabulary sets and radically uh, divergent grammatical structures are really just red herrings um, and ways of getting yourself off the hook that it is indeed difficult to translate properly. Um, you get yourself off this hook by saying, yeah, but in any case it's impossible. Well, I think that's too easy and that's not right. Um, but context is important and is difficult and it's very interesting um, to have a, a, a brief look at how that's handled. Um, I say because the context of utterance where a thing is said, and here we're talking especially about translation and less about interpreting, may be rather different from the context in which the translation is to be received. Yeah, where a thing comes from and where it's going. It's not the languages that may be the problem, it may be the, the worlds in which these things exist that may be sufficiently different to pose interesting problems, or rather, to prompt different kinds of solutions. Example, early years of 17th century, uh, Holland is a colonial power. It's um, taken over Sumatra and Java. Um, uh, it's around the same time, in fact, it's almost exactly the same year that in, uh, uh, in England, um, the new king, King James, summons a committee to produce a proper version of the Bible that everybody can understand. Yeah? So it's contemporary with that. Um, a, a young clerk is hired by the Dutch East India Company and he goes out to Sumatra and he seems to have been a sort of teenage genius because on the boat out there he learnt Persian and Sanskrit um, to while away the long sea crossing. Uh, gets to Java um, and listens to what people are saying and learns what was the language along the coast of Java then, Malay. Um, and first thing he does is writes a grammar of Malay. His name is Cornelius Ruhl. Uh, we should have appointed him to Princeton, really. But um, uh, then having written the grammar of this language, which is a new language, he wants to apply it. And so uh, he sets out to translate the uh, 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 Gospel of Matthew into Malay. Um, OK, fine. Uh, so you learn the grammar, then you start writing the language. That's, um, but he um, stumbled on a passage where Jesus sees a fig tree and says, may no fruit come from you again. It's Matthew 21, 18. Um, it's a little parable about the fig tree at the well. <clears throat> Figs are not native to Sumatra. Uh, they are not native to any of the areas where that language, Malay, is spoken. And therefore, Malay does not have a word for a fig. There's no earthly reason it should. I mean, languages don't have words for things their users have never heard of. Um, uh, it would be quite illogical if we did have spare words for things we hadn't yet encountered. So that's all very reasonable. That's how languages are. Um, there were no words for potato or tomato or coffee or llama in English prior to their being brought over from the New World um, in the 15th and 16th centuries. So what can 
Cornelius Royal do when encountering that sort of translation problem, which is not unique, uh, but it's just a lovely, it's just a nice example. And what he did, what, uh, what he did, and he may have been the first person to do this quite so obviously and clearly, is that he took a Malay word for something that did exist in Malay and that could, at a certain level of generality, stand in for a fig tree. Uh, he used the word pisang, which means a banana tree. Okay, so the parable, the, the moral message stays the same, but the vegetation changes. Okay, um, now the other thing he could have done, and that most of his predecessors did into all the languages of Europe, is just to use the Latin word and say, learn it. Yeah? You bring in, uh, with a new thing, a new word. So he could have said ficus, or however that would be pronounced in Malay, uh, or the Dutch word uh, uh, for fig which is related, but I can't pronounce it because Dutch is a very difficult language. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, I mean, that was common, and it still is common now in many directions of translation, is where, where you are going into a language where there is no word for the thing you're bringing in, you bring in the word with it. Yeah? Whereas he didn't do that. He made what we now call a cultural substitution. And it's ve it would be very interesting if somebody wanted to do a PhD is to see just what the boundaries of cultural substitution are. It's really common in Bible translation into the languages of Africa uh, and um, so-called third world countries. It's really common. It's the approach recommended by NIDA and the Bible Translation Society. It's really uncommon from African languages into English. Now, if you get anthologies of African folk tales, they don't put oak every time it says banyan. Yeah, we don't make a, a cultural substitution. And when you get, I don't know, uh, spy novels set in the old Soviet Union, you don't, and, and, and somebody turns up in a Zim limousine, uh, you don't put Cadillac instead, uh, because nobody around has ever seen a Zim. Um, so we don't do cultural substitution in some directions, and we do a lot of it in another. It does have to do with an inheritance of colonialism, but not only just, and it would be a really interesting thing to investigate as to uh, how that has been handled in different languages over the last few hundred years. Um, but clearly, it's got something to do with the sense of center and periphery, or with what I call up and down. Um, uh, uh, there may be political points to be made, but I think it, it's even more interesting than that, because it, in a sense, the, the distribution of cultural substitution as a translation device will tell you where centers and peripheries actually are much more accurately, I think, than any other kind of history. Um, in some philosophical sense, Banyan Pisang, ficus, fig, all mean the same thing, or rather would have exactly the same, have the same function at the, the level of understanding of the story in Matthew. Um, and philosophers and linguists and all sorts of other people have been searching for a long time for a language of such a high level of generality that would express those uh, underlying core units of meaning, irrespective of the grammar or vocabulary of any particular language actually spoken in this world. And this search for the, the super language, or the core language, you know, interlingua, um, is the subject of a really good joke in um, uh, a originally British radio serial called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. Um, to which the title of my book alludes. Um, uh, it's had a TV spin-off and a movie spin-off and all sorts of spin-offs, but it was originally a, um, a weekly radio broadcast that I listened to when younger than I am now. Um, uh, because obviously all science fiction um, or intergalactic, uh, interplanetary science fiction, uh, if it's to be <laughs> at all interesting, has to presuppose uh, other cultures you're in conflict with, and therefore has to propo propose some solution to the problem of how do you communicate with them. Yeah? Um, well, in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, uh, the hero, Ford Prefect, uh, uh, gets a ride on a spaceship 
piloted by Zephod Biebelbrox. Um, and he introduces Ford Prefect to what he calls the oddest thing in the universe. It's a small fish that fits neatly into your ear, and it converts not the language, but the brain waves of any other being in the universe into brain waves in your own brain. It's the uh, telepathic instant translator from any language to any other. Um, and that's why it's the oddest thing in the universe, because it actually works. And uh, the Babelfish in this spoof series is supposed to be definitive proof of the non-existence of God, since God couldn't possibly have invented anything so useful. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so that's uh, the reason for the title of my book. Um, uh, it's a reference to this uh, non-existent Babelfish. I mean, it's a joke about unmediated communication, about the unmediated uh, level of communication that so many scholars have sought to either devise or to reach, uh, um, either through improved languages, um, through formal languages, through mathematical languages, um, uh, through computers, etc., to reach you know, um, uh, a pure meaning um, uh, that just goes direct. And of course, um, uh, uh, God hasn't invented it, so it doesn't exist. And there's no such thing as a Babel fish. And there never will be, because communication is mediation. Uh, there, there is no unmediated communication. Uh, to the extent that anything can be communicated, it can only be communicated in a language, even if that language is as unlike English as algebra. Um, okay, um, so translation is just a particularly developed, sophisticated, uh, rule-bound and conventionalized form of mediation. <coughs> and I think it should not be seen as an add-on um, or as a compensation to something that would work much better if we didn't have to translate. On the contrary, um, it's not, uh, I mean, I, you, I see you use Babel on your poster for this. I hate that Babel. But Babel is the wrong, wrong idea because uh, linguistic diversity and therefore translation, these are not punishments for some ancient offense. Um, they belong to the very heart of what it is to be human, uh, what the heart of what it is to communicate. I am going on a bit longer than I should. Do you mind if I go along? Another five minutes, if you want to, because... Um, but we could do without... There are ways of doing without translation. And I know you, you hate it when people tell you this um, in the US administration and in schools. and We don't... We don't uh, they are unfortunately right. I mean, historically, uh, there are many ways of doing without translation. I just run through a few of them. If translation didn't work, we, we, we could behave like the ancient Athenians I've already mentioned. That if it's not, if, if it's not in Greek, it doesn't exist. Yeah? You, can, you can do that. Yeah. Um, and it is not a measure of stupidity, because you could hardly say Aristotle, Socrates, Homer, and that lot were stupid. But th they were just linguistic xenophobes. And as far as we know, they translated nothing from Persian. Um, or from any of the languages of the cultures in which they were in contact. Uh, 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 Trojans in Homer all speak Greek because that's why they're in Homer. If they didn't speak Greek, they wouldn't be in. Um, uh, it's quite extraordinarily linguistically um, blind, yeah? uh, ancient Greek culture. We could be like that. I mean, all right. Um, in the Roman Empire, what did the Romans do? They didn't translate anything either, except Greek. They had a huge inferiority complex about the Greeks, and basically the Romans built their own literature and culture out of translating from Greek. But they did not translate anything else. They took no interest whatsoever in the languages of the Gauls, or the Germanii, or the Etrurians, or the whatever. There, uh, there's just one non-Greek translation, and it's a Carthaginian agricultural treatise. Um, apparently the Carthaginians knew something about growing stuff in the desert that the Romans didn't. Um, but that's it. So it's an extremely linguistically um, homogenous society. It was a multilingual empire uh, with at least a hundred different languages stretching from the north of Britain to the Middle East. Um, uh, people spoke and wrote, you know, 
Aramaic and Syriac and Punic and all sorts of things. But from the point of view of running the empire, you did it in Latin, and if you couldn't do it in Latin, well, you didn't get a job. So you could do that as well. Um, and I think the ghost of Greece and Rome, the ghosts of Greece and Rome haunt the United States today. Um, and you just have to listen to what some of our senior politicians say about language policy and education policy to realize that, you know, 2,000 years on, 3,000 years on, I wouldn't say things never change, but it, it, it's, it's, um, it's an intellectual social position that um, just carries on, and maybe it's because we carry on also teaching Greek and Latin. Then. <laughs> so there's the Greek model, there's the Roman model, then there's the Indian model, which also doesn't do translation. Yeah? India is, a, as you know, it's a, a, a vast land of many, many different languages in which people learn several languages. There are almost no Indians who are monolingual. Um, th they will speak their uh, a very local tribal language, and they will speak a regional language, and they will speak a communicative language, be it Hindi or Urdu or Tamil or English. About 20% also have English. Uh, speaking five or six languages, not rare. But for that reason, there simply is no tradition of translating things between Indian languages. Things do get translated from the 22 official languages of India into English for recirculation in the other parts of India. The direct translation between Tamil and Marathi, or between you know, Canada and Bengali, well, a little bit exists now, but it, it's really in imitation of Europe. It is not a, an Indian tradition, it's not an Indian thing to do that. So you can have a multicultural, um, multilingual, uh, vibrant and very large society that has lots of languages and does not have translation. It, it, it exists. So there's three warnings. You can have a Greek, a Roman, or an Indian solution. I think all three are politically, are unacceptable to us now for social, political, moral, historical reasons. I don't think we could be like ancient Rome. Uh, we certainly don't. Nobody, I think, wants to be like India, which puts an obligation on you all to learn five languages at least in order to have any kind of a career. Um, not sure I'd be against it, but I just don't think it's going to happen. So given the absence of these options, we, we have translation. Translation is what stands in you, uh, and I think is actually much better than these uh, three ancient solutions. Um, Because the world we inhabit, uh, the Western world, uses translation at every level. Yeah? It, it inhabits our world with, through international organizations, global businesses, but also uh, small businesses. Uh, uh, religious faiths are products of translation in almost all respects. Um, media, news, we get world news in our language, even though it's happening in dozens of other languages almost instantaneously, uh, your daily life is uh, a run through with um, a, a translated text and translation, translatedness. I don't think there is a reading list on any college course in any discipline that is entirely free of translated works, though they're often presented as works in English but actually come from somewhere else. <coughs> so, that's one sort of observational, practical level that justifies my title that translation is the meaning of, anything, of everything, because without it, there, almost nothing in our contemporary world would have any meaning. But actually, that's, uh, I think, only just superficial. There's a deeper reason that I want to say a few uh, words about before I conclude. Uh, let's say an intrepid space explorer um, from Earth actually gets to some distant planet um, and gets back to Earth and on arrival on Earth announces, yes, you know, uh, there is another civilization out there on KX23Y, whatever the number of the planet is. Um, wow, uh, people say. Um, uh, did you manage to communicate with them? And he answers, yeah, sure, sure, I learned their language. Yeah. Wow, they say. Well, tell us, what did they say? And our space explorer says, oh, well, I can't tell you that. Everything they say is untranslatable. 
<laughs> exactly. You laugh. You think either he's pull having, uh, uh, pulling your leg or he's gone mad. Um, because it is not possible to say, I can communicate with that person, but I cannot translate anything. Yeah? Um, translatability is the guarantee of meaningfulness. Um, or to take the other end, not a futuristic, but a, a retrospective, an archaeologist discovers scratches on a cave wall and says, I think that's a language. You may think so, you say, but how do you know so? And we will only accept, and for good reason, that that is a language when some part of it can be translated. Now, we might have external reasons for believing it is a language, but we don't know the code and can't translate it. But those will be external. Internally, when you find a thing, unless you can, to some degree, decode it, you cannot even assert that it is a language. It might just be scratches on the wall. I mean, we can all make pretty scratches on the wall. Yeah? Um, <coughs> So, uh, this is the uh, squabble I have with some of my academic colleagues. Untranslatable is a non-concept. The, the untranslatable is that which doesn't even exist. Because by definition, for it to exist as communication, as, uh, uh, for it to exist in the world of language, in the, world, in the human world, it must be a possible uh, to say what it means, even if only roughly or approximately. Uh, the potentiality of translation, of translatability, is all that we really have to allow us to um, believe in the existence of some kind of a message. Okay. Um, and so you see why I really dislike uh, Genesis 11 and the story of the Tower of Babel. The story of the Tower of Babel begins um, uh, in, in the beginning, or to begin with, all the world was of one speech. You know, that is really, really unlikely. That is so implausible. You do not need to explain what happened next if you start with such an unbelievable circumstance. Um, all the world being of one speech is just how it did not happen. Um, because if all the world were ever of one speech, if linguistic diversity, the multiplication of tongues, is such a nuisance as it's supposed to be in the Babel story, well, why haven't we gone back to it? Because we know, all of us are language teachers or language we know there is no physiological obstacle to any of us learning any other language insofar as it's a human language, if you start young enough. We know there is no intellectual obstacle to learning another language because millions of people do it every day. Um, uh, th there is no conceivable reason why we shouldn't all speak the same language if that's what we wanted to do. Yeah? Um, and we've had tens of thousands of years of lead time to get round to doing it if we had wanted to do it. In practice, it could be done in one generation. Um, we've had hundreds of them, and nobody's wanted to do it. We don't speak the same because we don't want to. And why don't we want to? Well, just think about it. I speak the way I do, and which is a little bit different from the way you speak, because of the place I grew up in, because of my family background, because of the school I went to. Um, and OK, that defines me in very broad terms. You know. uh, but I don't actually speak the same way as the people, all the people who went to my school, and I don't speak exactly the same way as all the members of my family. In fact, I don't speak exactly like anybody else, and nor does each of you, and it's terribly useful. I can ring up my sister and say, hi, Viv, and she knows it's me. Um, I don't have to say who I am. Um, when you think about it, it is possible to speak like someone else. We have voice artists. We have Meryl Streep. Um, <laughs> you know, with training and thought, you can do it. And if it, ha if it were desirable to speak like anybody else, we would all learn to do it uh, as we learn to speak um, in our earliest years. And we know if it's all. 
But we don't. And we don't want to. Because if we did all speak alike, language would not be very useful. The one thing you always say when you open your mouth is, this is me, not you. You can only do that because language is variety, language is variable, and each of us uh, develops our own uh, 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 unique individual voice print um, as we grow up to be who you are. Yeah? Um, if that were not the case, it would be dreadful. I mean, you know, the lights go out, it's dark, and somebody says, uh, I'll go get the torch. And you can't tell whether this is Uncle Bob or a space, a, a space intruder. <laughs> you don't know who is talking. Um, the identifying function of language is, to my mind, absolutely primordial. And that uh, distinctiveness, variety, variation <coughs> is the nature of language. Um, now, you might object, well, you know, diction and uh, voice timbre are really rather different aspects from vocabulary and grammar. But we vary in vocabulary and grammar, too. The set of words that I use overlaps with the set of words you use, but it is not exactly the same. Um, there is uh, um, individual variation in all dimensions of language, and what we call a different language is just variation only more so, um, and going further. So, uh, I don't believe Babel's story. Uh, I, because if the Babel story were true, then we would again all be speaking the same language, and we manifestly don't want to, and it wouldn't be at all useful if we did. I think we would use language for far more restricted range of purposes, and it, it, it's like space travel. Our society would be quite unrecognizable. So that's why I say translation is the meaning of everything, just as variation is the nature of language. Uh, it requi that that, that uh, fundamental nature of language means that we require translation, to live in a civilized manner um, and not to adopt the Greek or Roman solutions to the uh, problem of linguistic diversity, uh, which I'm sure we don't really don't want to anymore. Okay, so that's where I end. And I'm sorry I've gone on a bit too long. Do you have time? Are you willing to field a couple sure. of questions? Somebody wants one already. Yes, uh, madam. So I was really interested in the pivotal language being English, and it has been since after World War II, as you were saying. And I was thinking about the Red Chinese who imposed Mandarin on its country uh, people. Mm -hmm. And so do you have any prediction for the pivotal language as we move out in time? Is it going to be a language like we know, or is it going to be some kind of computer thing, or what is it? I, 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 I can tell you about languages, but I don't possess a crystal ball. <laughs> I mean, you know, history is a succession of unlikely events. So something unlikely will happen, but <laughs> I don't know what that will be. If things stay as they are, English is uh, in a very dominant position and uh, without some shock or transformation I can't imagine, uh, it will be hard to dislodge English from that position because it gets built into all sorts of structural things. Um, and it, I'm sure the European Union will carry on using English as its working language e even when Britain has left and uh, the European you know, uh, no, in, 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 but who knows? I mean, uh, the Chinese want English to be the, their international language. They don't want to use, they do not use Chinese as an international language. And I think with a quarter of the world's population leaning that way, it's going to take something quite formidable to lean back with some other language. But you never know. You don't know. I don't know what that is. <laughs> you have, it puzzled me. It's a phenomenal lecture. Thank you. Um, it puzzled me when you said that Spanish is not a pivot language, mm. and I was wondering, is that any theory that you had, is it economic, is it geographic? May I interrupt to ask, will you repeat back the question for the television recording? Thank you. Yeah, the question is, uh, what are the reasons uh, that make Spanish not a pivot language of any significance in the world today? Um, History of the Spanish Empire, 
the marginality of Spain geographically with respect to the rest of Europe, collapse of Spanish empire, poverty of Spain, Franco. Uh, I mean, people have forgotten now, but you know, Franco really took Spain out of this actually conversation of nations. I, mean, I remember my uncle telling me when I was 15 or 16, don't go to Spain, he said, Spain is a dead country. And I grew up with that view, and so did most people of my generation. You didn't go there. Um, and it's a tragedy. And of course, from the American point of view, it's not uh, quite like that. But I think it had a global kind of effect on attitudes towards Spain. Another reason, it's much more particular, but it's quite powerful, is this. The, the, since translation is essentially a matter of books, and I mean books lead, as a matter, um, the Spanish language book world is very fragmented as between the different Spanish-speaking countries of Latin America and Spain itself. So that you haven't got a single translation into Spanish or a single publisher in Spanish language for an author. So that you don't get the same sense of control or volume or of importance. Um, and there are all sorts of complicated questions of rights. That if you want to use a Spanish translation as a relay, yeah, uh, ha, ha do you pay the Argentinian publisher or the Bolivian publisher? So you just don't bother. So I think those are all uh, um, long range, short range, and sort of mm, intricate. Um, but even so, it is odd. That, I mean, it is the third most commonly spoken tongue on the planet, and it is not a pivot. It is not used as a uh, prestige language. Uh, and, and so there is a much translation into native languages, uh, the Latin native languages of um, South and Central America through Spanish then? Um, no. Uh, 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 so that means, says, there's not a lot of translating from Spanish into the indigenous languages of Latin America. And I said, no, there isn't, because there is not very much publishing in the indigenous languages of Latin America. And uh, I don't know much about it, but I do know that. Um, some of the Bible translation into indigenous Latin American languages is from, uh, from English rather than from Spanish. Some of it anyway, because I've seen some articles about it. Uh, um, yeah, Spanish is an odd, odd position. Well, Portuguese is even odder. I mean, Portuguese is spoken on all continents. Um, but it's not really used as an intermediary language uh, between anything and anything. I'm sure you've been asked before. Um, uh, one is about sign language, which if it doesn't, if, is there a universal language is what I'm saying. And sign language certainly uh, communicates the emotional content of language in many ways better. And the other is what about music? That could be called a universal language maybe. Maybe. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I don't really want to comment on music because then we'll get into it and painting and dance and, and, yeah. then, uh, and that's a bit m more than I can take on. Um, but sign language, uh, uh, quite specifically, the sign languages that are used by the uh, deaf are human inventions. They were invented, or the first one was invented in the late 18th century. Uh, prior to that, um, I think deaf people had a really rough time. But there are many uh, sign languages. Uh, there's American Sign Language, which is descended from French Sign Language, which was the first to be invented. Then there's BSL, British Sign Language, is quite a different system. And the Russians have another system. They're not mutually comprehensible. Uh, so these are real languages. Uh, they were invented, but once they got taken up, they, they work like languages. And Deaf children have kitty slang in sign and so forth, and there are jargons, and so they have all the features of a language. But I think when you said sign language, you meant not that. You meant um, uh, what my colleagues call paralinguistic signaling. Um, that's to say gestures, uh, movements of the uh, muscles of the face and especially of the hands. Um, and they seem to us eloquent. Um, and natural and universal, but actually they're not. I mean, uh, uh, they're uh, depending on where you are and which language your gestures are accompanying. Uh, uh, the actual physical movement may have uh, different meanings or different shades of meaning. Um, uh, the most spectacular is uh, yes and no. Uh, 
that we think, well, everybody says that for yes and that for no, but it's not true because if in Bulgaria you say yes, you say yes. Uh, <laughs> it's very hard to do, actually, you keep saying yes. Yeah, no. Um, no, but there are real differences. So the universality of sign languages uh, is, well, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, that might mean, uh, what that means in every language of the world, I do not know. Uh, I'm, there are probably people who've investigated it, but, uh, but I can tell you they're not as universal as they seem. Um, uh, be precisely because they're less specific than actual words, you can delude yourself into thinking that it's a universal language, but actually it's not, or not quite. Yes? So the question is, do I think that um, uh, politically correct speech, as imposed in uh, uh, some colleges and universities, is actually producing a language so thin and ethereal that it might approximate to the, um, uh, the one speak um, of, uh, 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 of um, pure meaning? Um, my answer is no, uh, because the effect of all these language codes is to make people speak in code. And the codes then need translating. And then when they've translated them, they discover that actually they need another code to stop people saying that. So, so it goes on. And actually, it's much, I think it's much more likely that those and all other attempts to make people speak this way or that way are ex should be taken as examples of the potential of the potential the language always has for uh, diversifying itself and for being made different and not the same. Yes, ma'am. So the question is whether um, the decoding of a previously unidentified language um, or of a new language, a recently uh, a discovered language, whether it's spoken or um, reconstructed from writing, whether that's translating up or translating down. I think my terminology doesn't really apply there. I think you say that's something I left out. <laughs> You'd have to think of an adaptation of it. Um, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't fit. A weakness in my nomenclature. It doesn't fit that situation where you have a, a new... Yeah. Uh, no.